everyone. Okay. Um, we are quite a bit behind schedule, and while I know everybody expects that from these kind of events, we don't want it to get any worse, so um, we will press on. Um, and once again, I just want to say uh, apologies again on the ISL, um, where we were um, unavoidably uh, let down this morning. Um, and Michael has come back to um, uh, sign this session. Uh, and then he'll take a break before lunch, but we have managed to get some cover for the afternoon, so all the afternoon sessions will be fully signed. And again, apologies for that, um, but we're, we're working on that resolution. So now, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to our chair uh, of the next session, uh, which is about the accessibility of voting in Ireland. And Christabel Feeney, who is Director of Employers for Change at the Open Doors Initiative, is going to chair this session for us. Christabel has a Master's in Political and Public Communications, a degree in e Economics, Politics and Law, and a Professional Diploma in Diversity, Equity, Belonging and Inclusion, so clearly she never sleeps. Um, <laughs> she has worked on numerous campaigns, including the Marriage Equality Referendum, and has created training programs to support women on their political journey and grassroots networks to div drive diversity, equality and inclusion within politics. And she will introduce our speakers on this session. And hopefully, if everyone keeps to time, there might be some space for questions and answers at the end. Over to you, Christopher. Thanks very much, um, Aideen. I think, having listened to that, I need maybe to pare back that bio a little bit. Um, it's great to be here this morning and to see so many people in the room and online. Um, and I've been given a wonderful panel to chair. Um, we have great speakers lined up for you here and we will do our best to keep to time. So I'll be introducing each of the speakers before they start. They will get 10 minutes each um, and I'll be letting them know when, when they're eight minutes in. So to begin, we're going to have Dr. Vivian Rath, who's an academic and a human and uh, disability rights activist and advocate. He's an adjunct teaching fellow in Trinity College Dublin and a research officer on the reasonable accommodation and professional placement programme with the head. So Vivian is going to give us some context, I suppose, around this topic of accessibility of voting in Ireland. So over to you, Vivian. Thank you very much, uh, Christabel. Uh, and it's lovely to be here and uh, I'd say, I wonder does it say a lot, we have two Wexford men on the stage here today, so it uh, could be 1798 all over again uh, uh, in terms of trying to access our rights. Um, but uh, that if we could just move forward there to the first couple of slides. So I'm, I'm presenting today on the voting experiences of disabled voters during general election 2020. And that, so I'm going to very quickly, uh, as mentioned by Christabel, uh, run through the background to a survey that we completed. Uh, we're going to look at some of the barriers to voting. Uh, I'm going to specifically maybe focus in a little on postal voting, uh, complaints, improvements, and then I'm going to conclude. Next slide. Okay, so just some context to uh, the survey. So um, myself and uh, Maria Ni Flaherty uh, undertook uh, uh, what is a, really a small survey immediately after general election 2020 to capture uh, voting experiences of disabled voters. Um, it, the, the survey came about as a result of my own uh, voting experiences where I myself uh, actually uh, wasn't able to uh, vote uh, in privately uh, and uh, also had access difficulties to a voting station. Um, we, what I suppose is important to note about this was that it, was a, it really was just to capture a snapshot uh, of what was happening and was the, the survey itself was based on uh, existing literature that exists around voter barriers and, and the questions were framed around that. There were 10 questions, uh, mostly focusing on uh, around disability, accessibility of in-person voting, postal voting. Uh, would you make a complaint? And I think that's always an important question because it gives you a sense of the kind of trust uh, that's within the system and, and what would support you. Because it's, it's, it's not good enough just to focus on the barriers. We also need to be able to focus on the enablers. What work, what can we, we do to improve the system? Um, what I think is important to note, to my knowledge, it is the only uh, survey that has been carried out on disabled voter experiences uh, in Ireland immediately after a general election. Uh, so uh, next slide, please. So 
uh, there was one quick question which was focusing on did you face barriers. Uh, uh, there is a graphic on the screen uh, and it, it notes uh, what is in the text, which is uh, overall there are 169 responses to the survey. Yes, it was small. Uh, yes, we didn't have the resources. It was done voluntary, so we wouldn't have been able to publicise it to the level we would l have liked. Uh, but what is uh, noted, it was online, it was available online. Hard copy surveys were available to people, and of course we had uh, an easy to read version which we could send out as well. Uh, of the 169 responses, 157 uh, identified as disabled voters. Uh, and as I mentioned, there's a graphic, and on that graphic, it identifies that 52% of the 57, 157 face barriers to voting. 48% uh, said they did not experience barriers. What's, what's kind of interesting to that is it's someone, somewhat relatable uh, to the figures that we just heard about in, in Northern Ireland, which I think is, is reassuring for me. Um, but uh, of course, uh, that it, it is concerning that there is still that amount of voters, disabled voters who completed the survey uh, face those kind of barriers. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of the different barriers, I'm, there was many barriers that were raised across. But in terms of the top six, well, lack of accessible voting information, uh, that was actually a very, very significant one. And we did have a comment section, and one in which uh, those who completed the survey gave comment on, and I'll come to some of those later. But in terms of the accessible voting information, people uh, requiring uh, more information around actually using the voting system, especially perhaps around uh, the Braille voting system. And I'm sure Robbie will speak to that. He's much better positioned to do that. A lack of disability awareness. And when I say that, I'm actually talking about within the polling stations uh, and the polling clerks. And also, of course, then, if we look at the wider system, and this was mentioned, of course, was in relation to uh, the political... Uh, parties and, of course, that information too. Um, inaccessible polling booths and stations. Well, of course, I mentioned that was my own experience, uh, but that was the experience of many other voters as well, where they didn't, uh, where there wasn't a, 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 a polling booth, what we describe as an accessible polling booth. And I think it was really interesting to hear the Estonian presentation where the accessible polling booth is actually, they're universally designed, so they're open to everybody. So really then, there isn't need for regular polling boot and an accessible polling boot if we just went for a universal design approach. And I, I really think that that, uh, as our constitution notes, that we have the right to vote in private. Uh, and really, I think that is something that we really need to work on and can be done, I feel, easily, um, and is, is one we can win on. Wasn't sure how to vote. Um, and I think that's a very interesting one. And I think, again, around if there really needs to be more information on that. And, and people spoke about they weren't sure, they didn't like, they didn't, they weren't sure if they could, they didn't have access to the information on how to vote. Didn't have access to a personal assistant. And this is one of the ones that I think is certainly is one of the in and, uh, unintended consequences of not including disabled people in, in the decision making about when we set the voting. So the election for, for all of you, do, well, for some of you who might remember, it took place on a Saturday and people didn't actually have access to their personal assistant on the Saturday and so they couldn't go to vote. And there are some other interesting comments in relation to personal assistance support voting and candidature and other aspects that I'm going to come to later. Inaccessible uh, voting materials. Uh, again, I'm going to leave Robbie to mention that, but that was something that came up for both um, people who had uh, issues with literature, li literacy, so literacy issues, uh, people who uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps had intellectual disability, uh, where there wasn't easy read versions, and so there was lots of kind of concerns uh, around that. Next slide, please. So I mentioned I was going to uh, just very briefly comment on postal voting, because for some it was an important aspect. There was a, a small proportion, proportion of those who completed the survey identified as having undertaken postal voting. Um, the majority reported a positive voting experience. However, if I just go back a step, I just mentioned that all, all, around half of all postal voters reported facing 
other barriers. So although they, they identified the post-voting experience as a positive experience, they still were in the category of facing barriers to voting. And a lot of the comments re reflected this in terms of saying, I felt I had to vote using a postal vote because the polling station was inaccessible. I had to use a postal vote because I didn't have a PA support. I had, so I think that's very interesting, that when you get into the data a little bit more, you see the complexities around it. Um, there is half of all postal voters reported facing other barriers, uh, I, some of them no information in ISL, two visits for postal vote, these are direct comments on happy, um, happy about having to use this method. I want to read a comment very quickly if, uh, from one of the, the participants. It provides me with greater opportunities to vote as I neither have to travel to a polling station and I, can use, and I can't use technology to read the ballot paper. However, a postal vote should not be versus the only alternative to voting in the traditional manner in a polling station. Next slide, please. I think that comment says a lot. If you had a difficulty, would you make a complaint? Well, there were uh, uh, really, that was, uh, there was a, a large percentage actually who said they would make a complaint. And there were people who actually said they had made a complaint and they had heard nothing back. And I think we need to really look around that. We need to look at the complaints procedure, particularly on the day, so as that we could resolve issues quickly uh, and ensure the person gets the vote on the day. And I think we need to look at how we can do that. Next slide, please. There's some comments here, I'm going to have to leave you to read them later because t the clock is ticking down. But uh, I think, uh, 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 you know, they, they identify the, some of the ways you could improve the voting experience. Next slide, please. So, in terms of conclusions, these are just some of the conclusions that were uh, I came to after it. Disabled people face significant barriers during general election 2020. Many of these barriers could easily be resolved. Um, in terms of participating, there's a failure, not only across the, the electoral system, but political parties and broadcasters also need to take responsibility for this to bring about change. Decision making, I've just mentioned the, in, the unintended consequences of not including disabled people in the decision making. And the last one, we need to increase awareness of disabled voting rights. We need some kind of complaints mechanism uh, that we can get a swift response from and action. And finally, we need to focus on, it's not just access to the polling station, it's the wider holistic voting experience that we need to be working on as well. Okay, thank you very much. Thank, thanks very much, Vivian. And I think there'll be lots of questions um, later. Hopefully, we'll have some time that, that people will have after that presentation because it was very, very informative. Next, we're going to have Dr. Robert Sinnott, who's the coordinator of Voice of Vision Impairment. And Dr. Sinnott won a landmark high court case against the state regarding the rights of visually impaired people, um, so blind or partially sighted individuals, to vote in secret. So in other words, without an assistant. And Robert's going to talk us through that case and his experience of this topic. So over to you, Robert. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I suppose I'd like you all to imagine uh, you're in a polling station and somebody says, you have to wear a blindfold. Put a blindfold on. And then they say, now tell me how you're going to vote. And don't take that blindfold off till I put the, your vote in the ballot box. Then you can take it off. And I think you can imagine that the problem there is not just secrecy of ballot, the problem is also verification. You don't have an idea what that person has voted. So that person has two pieces of information. That person knows uh, how you intended to vote, but they are the only person who knows how you actually voted. You do not know how you voted. And that was the main reason I bought that case. It was verifiability, it wasn't secrecy. Secrecy was, the, it was a very important, but it was the only way we could get it in Irish law, because Irish law intrinsically presumed everybody could see and verification would never be an issue. But um, so the judge did agree with that in, in the summing up, but I'll get to that. I, got, uh, I was always visually impaired, severely visually impaired. I uh, was diagnosed with cataracts in 2009, I'd been going on for five years, and so it was anyway, 2010, I, I used to be able to vote close up with the thing, with the ballot paper, etc., cetera, um, magnifying glass and all. But 
in 2010, I tried to vote, or 2009, I can't remember, and uh, it might have been 2011 elections, and I wasn't able to vote. And a kind assistance, kind, you know, this is a charity model of disability, he said, uh, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll do it for you. I'll, I'll uh, mark down your votes. So there was, I think, 19 candidates. So I go through the whole lot. Anyway, he was so proud of what he did, so enthusiastic, that he let the entire room know exactly how I voted. <laughs> He called out all 19, and I, I kept asking him to stop. I was sort of a bit mortified. And uh, he actually decided to do it again, just to be sure. So I, I, went to the, um, I went to all sorts of people, the sheriffs. I, I didn't know that the uh, sheriff's office had something to do with it, but they all have somewhere the, the chain of command goes right up uh, or right across or wherever. Anyway, um, so they said, I got this strange letter back from the Department of the Environment, who was in charge of voting. If you, feel, if you feel so strongly about your rights, why don't you take us to court? This was in 2011. I'm glad I kept that email. I was able to use it in court. But <laughs> it's just some of the attitude of some of the civil servants is just bizarre in any country, I think. Anyway, in 2014, I didn't jump straight into court. I tried to reason with them. It took a very long time getting nowhere. And I was working with somebody called Patrick McCarthy, Blind Legal Alliance, we were called. Uh, uh, it's, it's an, Ir an Irish phrase, uh, we're stronger together. And this is what we did. Uh, 2014, we approached Public Interest Law Alliance. They accepted us as an NGO, even though there was only three of us in it at that stage. And they took the case, and it was really good. Uh, 2016, uh, there was a trial. I was cross-examined cross for five days because they tried to hammer... They tried to intimidate me, I suppose, understand. They were trying to make it all about me, something wrong with me. I have some prejudice, didn't like guards or something. That, that was because they asked me, why wouldn't you let a guard vote for you? And I said, well, it's a public official. So they tried all sorts of things. But the state does not like anyone taking cases. This wasn't about me. And they threatened me with all sorts of financial ruin and threatened that I should leave. Um, but the, it all comes down to Michael McDool came on the case, he was fantastic, he, constitution lawyer, but the constitution wasn't needed, thankfully. There was already 1996 legislation that actually said there had to be template voting, and that was ignored. So that it was a straightforward case of that. They tried all sorts of shenanigans to get out of it and to say that they were doing it and we needed to drop it. And the, the judge came in with a brilliant decision and he actually involved... And he said I had to be involved, and now that's my, our organisation, Voice of Vision Impairment, has to be consulted with. Um, he didn't mention that, he didn't know that, but the, the CRPD, we'll get to that later, uh, Convention of the Rights of People with Disabilities sort of says that. So, uh, we move on a bit. So, what we, after, uh, as a result of it, uh, I was put on the working group the, the, uh, from the franchise unit, the department of, uh, it is now the Department of Housing, that's, that's where voting is now, so that's the franchise unit, housing and local government. So uh, on that then we got tactile template voting. And it was interesting to hear that a case was taken in 2019 to say it's inaccessible in Britain. That's all my case managed to get for the time being, apart from publicity for the thing. It's a long way to go. All we can do in the meantime until there's new legislation is to tweak the system because it's so bad uh, still. But I, I was able to vote for the first time in, uh, independently in, I think, a 2020 election. And I was delighted to be able to do it. I wasn't the only one. And uh, the, because it was just took so much tweak, and it still is a long way to go, it's getting there. But it's not the end all. Our voice of vision impairments idea is that we need choice, and it's all about choice. So in Australia, New Zealand, they phone voting. Uh, which is really accessible. We, there's eye voting, which is absolutely fantastic to, to hear uh, such a brilliant Nelika's beautiful uh, presentation today. And also we have, um, I think that's the main thing, we still do not have Shannon voting because that wasn't included. So visually impaired people still cannot uh, participate in Shannon voting. I'd have two votes, possibly UCD and Trinity, but maybe I should have known. I don't know. <laughs> that's gerrymandering in another way. But like, um, the, the another thing is, so... Uh, we have, there's also just finally a new context. Now, there, I, I know, uh, sorry, um, uh, uh, sorry, um, <laughs> I'm just terrible with names. I'm trying to remember Vivian's name, sorry. That Vivian was speaking about, uh, about uh, access to the materials. And that is absolutely, that's something that we're working on. All the council sites, 
A phone, vote, phone is no good if you're in a, a polling booth to find out, go through, cycle through the candidates, because it'll take an hour. If you're talking about 18 candidates, you can listen to all their details. You only get one go at it each time before you can listen to them all again. And then you've got another hand holding the phone, another hand writing, another hand feeling the template, and another hand, I don't know, yeah, how many hands would you need? So it's not very practical. It's somebody else's idea. But OK, I think finally finish off with that we're in a context now of Article, it's not just Article 29. Uh, there's a, there's a cross-cutting Article 4, 3, 4 brackets, 3, and it's a general obligation on all states, and that is that disabled people are closely consulted and actively involved through their representative organisations, and these are not service providers. It's like the difference between trade unions and employers. And I notice that that's sadly lacking in Britain and a lot of other countries as well. So the RNIB for Britain is, is a service provider, so it's totally... Britain didn't even show up for the UN report on its CRPD. That's how far behind this. So sometimes these look good to the outsider, what's going on, but there's no real consultation. And it's the idea of narrow, not broad consultation. The narrow is deep. So it means that you don't, you, there's no replication. It means that everything, uh, rather than just having, uh, asking the same questions every five years, that there's a continuity built up with the actual voice of members and that an environment is created where everybody uh, in a constituency, in our case visually impaired, is encouraged to join their DPRO, Disabled Persons Representative Organisation, and uh, that, that the DPROs are heard and listened to. And it's worth our while because we put, go to the trouble of putting together collective policies, prioritising those with least resources and least supports. And in order to do that, that takes a lot of time. So that should not be aggregated with the voice of uh, one individual or with uh, a service provider, etc., and it's really important that has given weight. So I think that's it. But uh, oh yeah, and, and art's great to have art. I, I know there should be a link to art, and I should say something about the electoral commission. But uh, I think we have a lot of work to do together on a lot of different areas. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thanks very much, Robert. And you actually finished before I managed to hit the glass. So I thought you did, you did really well. That was very... Um, I'll take very <laughs> you did a, a great job there of talking us through that experience that you had. Um, so thank you very much for that. Last but not least, we have Art O'Leary, the Chief Executive of On Commission Tochon. I hope I pronounced that correctly for the Irish speakers in the room. Um, and that's the Electoral Commission, which is a new management and oversight organisation for electoral and, un and democracy matters. So Art is going to tell us a little bit about that, and I suppose we'll, we'll tie um, in what we've heard so far from, from Vivian and from Robert. So over to you, Art. Mila Buikas, Chris Tabella, Agus Asoktan Quirra, Veliv, Eron Okoid Special to show on you. Um, it's a great privilege um, to be here to address you here today, and um, I've been an admirer of Vivian and uh, Robert's work for many years because theirs are such important voices um, in this, what should be a national conversation and, and, and a much bigger national conversation. Um, I, I've been hearing a lot about myself uh, this morning in, in all of the conversations so far, and it, it seems like every time I open a newspaper or turn on the radio or the television, um, I keep finding something else that the Electoral Commission um, is going to be responsible for, and it's another problem that we're going to make go away. And um, it reminds me of that famous Homer Simpson line, you know, it's, uh, I, we seem to be the cause of and solution to all of life's problems. but. Um, but I, I can say, you know, um, and we have had an initial conversation um, at electoral commission level with this and about this issue, and I have suggested to the electoral commission members that um, our ambition in this area should be eye-watering, you know. I, and I mean, I don't say that lightly, because this is an area, if we work properly, we can make a very real difference to people's lives, you know, and it is a sad state of affairs that we have to work so hard to um, uh, make lives better for people with a disability about participating in electoral life, but um, this is the world in which we find ourselves, and without too much difficulty, 
we should be able to make um, a very real difference. As Aideen mentioned earlier on, um, we have every single type of electoral event which it is possible to have in the next two years. So we will have local elections, European elections, looks like there's four referendums coming. We'll have a general election, we'll have a Shannon election, we'll have a presidential election. There's going to be a directly elected mayor election in Limerick City um, next year. And it looks like the people of Dublin might have a plebiscite in which um, they get to decide whether they want a directly elected mayor as well. So um, as well as providing um, facilities and opportunities to include everybody in the electoral process, it also provides us with an extraordinary opportunity to learn, you know, and um, this is why we're here today um, as well. This organisation today is 259 days old, you know, so we can't solve every single problem um, today, tomorrow or the day after. But we're hoping that if we approach this properly in the months and years ahead, right, we can, as I said, make a very real difference to people's lives. I, I should say we have um, uh, some members of the Electoral Commission team here with us today. And uh, please don't leave this room today without having a conversation um, with some of them. If you've got something to say, and if, uh, I mean, the one word that, um, that really kind of grated with me this morning was complaint. You know, I mean, um, people feel they have to complain. You know, that's not the business that we're in. We're here listening to challenges and opportunities. Our job is to fix these. Never ever feel like you're complaining because you're trying to be involved in public life and participating in electoral processes. So we, had our, we have our head of, um, Education and Public Engagement, Sarah Keevney here. Um, we have Eunice Delaney, who will be head of the post-electoral reviews, which I'll speak about in a minute. And we have uh, Seamus O'Reilly, uh, head of uh, electoral operations. Um, he'll be keeping an eye on all eight electoral events. And uh, Anne-Marie Power from our comms division. This is the importance that we attach um, to this event. It is so important that we get to know you. You're a really important stakeholder. The one word I did enjoy hearing this morning was collaboration. We're a small org organization right now. There's 20 something people. This time next year will be 50 something. We can't change the world with 50 something people, but working with you, we can make a real difference. And so we, get, we hope to work with people with a disability, with travelers, with immigrants, with women's groups, and I'm delighted to see Brian Sheehan um, here as well, head of Women for Election. Very, very important stakeholders in our lives. I um, uh, coincidentally, I spoke at the Iraq Dis Disability Matters Committee yesterday um, with uh, John Dolan, who's um, here today from, um, from DFI, and I got the opportunity to speak very formally um, about uh, some of our plans in this area and, and what we're all about. I, I feel as if I'm amongst friends this morning, so I'll skip all the formal stuff and maybe skip on to three areas where we can really work together to make a difference to people's lives and to improve and enhance the electoral participation of people with a disability. First is in the research area. We have extraordinary um, research powers and we have huge discretion um, to do research as well. Delighted to see um, Vivian's work, the output of Vivian's work here as well, because things will never change when people just simply tell stories of their experiences. It's very important that we capture the narrative, etc. But policy change happens in this country on the basis of data and hard evidence. Our job in the years ahead is to capture the hard evidence and the data of the experiences of people's lives. Vivian's work is an important first step in this journey, but we are going to invest a huge amount of time and energy. Um, I successfully managed to wangle a million euro out of um, the Department of Public Expenditure for research for next year. The starting, we're going to start a longitudinal study, um, which is a 25-year study where we can track progress in this area. Our ability to do research in this area, we hope to blow the doors off here and provide the government and the House of Oireachtas with real evidence 
and real data in relation to the lived experience of people with a disability, because that's the way that we can deliver change. Um, Post-electoral event reviews, I mentioned that Eunice is here today. After every single one of these eight electoral events in the next two years, we're going to talk to everybody that we can about the experience and their own personal experience of electoral events. We need to hear from you. Um, you have a voice. Please let us hear it. It's not a complaint. We want feedback. We want data. We'll talk to the NDA and the DFI and whatever other representative groups as well. Stay in touch and give us the evidence, give us the feedback as well, because we can't fix these problems unless we know they exist. You know, and um, uh, Vivian's, again, Vivian's data here is of the six or seven issues um, that arose. Um, we can make a real difference. We can change some of those really very easily. You know, even the the issue around personal assistance on um, on a Saturday, um, people thought that the government thought that um, it was a good idea um, to have uh, elections on a Saturday because people will be more um, more available. Um, that turned out not to be the exact experience um, of, so of some individuals, for working parents who work all week, etc. Well, Saturdays are like Christmas Day or Christmas Eve for some of them because there's sporting activities, you do your shopping, you do all the things that you don't have time to do in the week, you do on a Saturday and trying to cram in time for voting as well. So, I mean, it, it is the lived experience. We needed to try it. If it works, great, let's do it. If not, then let's look at alternatives. And I know that um, there is a representative, Stephen is here from the Department of Housing um, as well, to gather up this data that feeds into um, to policy development. I know time is short, Christabel. I, I'll, um, I, I can speak for a couple of days on, on this, so uh, 10 minutes is hard. The final piece um, I do want to talk about is um, education and public engagement, you know, information accessible information in every part of the electoral process because it's we've heard a lot today about accessibility of polling stations nah i mean i don't think we should we should be called an electoral commission i think we should be called a democracy commission because all of the really really cool work we're going to get to do happens in between electoral events you know it is education it's information it's getting people onto the electoral register so everybody in this country um who should be on the electoral register, needs to be on the electoral register. It's not always their fault that they're not on the electoral register. It's our fault. We don't try hard enough. And I was at a, a, a citizens' assembly meeting um, during the summer, and um, something, somebody said something at the meeting. It was a, it was a guy who worked in a, 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 a treatment centre for, for addicts, and he said, there are no such thing as hard-to-reach people or hard-to-reach groups. They're only hard to reach services. And I couldn't agree more. It transformed the way I think about this whole issue, you know, because I've been looking at this from the wrong end of the telescope. People with a disability get up in the morning, they live their lives. How dare I think that they are hard to reach? My job is to be in the space where they hang out, in places where they hang out, and make a real difference, and explain to them what way the electoral process, encourage them to be involved, and where there are challenges, to fix it. That's the space that we need to be in. And this is why the work that Sarah and Eunice is going to do is so important to making um, a, a, a real difference. The final um, thing I, I would say is, um, I mean, we've spoken about, uh, and it was touched on in, in the early session, I love to hear from other countries about um, their experiences because all of the solutions to these challenges won't be found in this country alone. It will be beyond our shores, you know, and I, I was fortunate enough to be in Australia last year to have a look at the way they, um, they do elections in that country. They make it easy for people to vote in Australia. Australia, it's compulsory voting, so it's incumbent on them to make it easy. That should be our starting point. We make it easy. I turned up in the Australian Embassy recently, they had a referendum on rights for indigenous peoples and um, we turned up in the embassy. In every embassy across the world, as an Australian citizen, no matter where you are, you turn up in your embassy and say, I'd like to vote. In two weeks, the two weeks before polling day, and um, 
It's an extraordinary thing. Make me, I wanted to burst into tears to see people queuing up in the embassy wanting to vote on these rights for indigenous people. But the thing that really struck me that in this small embassy, um, it was fully accessible. They had a wheelchair accessible polling booth um, as well to, uh, to ensure privacy in, in this space too. And um, it was something that was so simple. If they can do it in every embassy, in every small embassy in the, in the world, why can't we do it in polling stations? And um, I am so pleased that there's been some great work done um, by the Department of Housing in recent years. Uh, there's a, well, as famously, there's a, a lot done and more to do. But the one that I did want to talk about was postal voting. Um, I think the Electoral Reform Act last year, no apologies, yeah, this is my final, definitely my final point. The, um, the postal voting, um, in the Electoral Reform Act, the, um, the, the removal of the obligation to register every year is now gone. And so you register once and then you have a postal vote for life. You know, I think that is huge. Not too many people know about it. And we need, this is our job as the Electoral Commission to try and get that word out there. I mean, I, I'm, I'm hearing stories since yesterday about the difficulty in getting medical certification and the cost involved as well. We need to look at this too. But this is the kind of thing that you need to be talking to us about. Um, we are a tr transparent and open organization. Please come and tell your stories. Uh, please come and give us your data and stay in touch. We can't do this job, this really valuable and worthwhile job without you. Thank you very much. And apologies, Christabel. Thank you. Thanks very much, Art. Um, I hope you don't put me out of a job in the future of chairing these after going over well, I'm, I'm, by I'm, so much time. <laughs> I, I, I'm trying to put myself out of a job. That's the problem. You know, I, I, I shouldn't have to exist as an, an electoral commission because this stuff should happen automatically. So, um, absolutely. yeah. Absolutely. Um, thanks so much. Three brilliant panellists. Hopefully we have some questions. I know that for the last session we went online first. So this time I think we'll go to the floor. And I actually see somebody with their hand up down here. So do we have somebody with a microphone? Somebody here? Thank, thanks very much to everybody. Uh, Jerry Kerr from the Public Participation Network. Just to very quickly give you the context, there's 31 public participation networks throughout the country with every uh, local authority. And there's nearly half a million people, volunteers involved in 25,000 organizations. I'm here in Dublin. And my question is, first of all, to thank Robbie and Vivian very aware of their work and to thank uh, Art for his very inspirational talk there and to ask him once again to solve the problems of the world. My question is in a very complicated and polarized world where we really need to deepen democracy more in the context of public participation and disability thematic groups within every one of those counties, which is amazing. Uh, people feel a sense of belonging to their county, to a place, and it's really strong, and from that they participate. Unfortunately, the way our constitution and the way your criteria are to divide things up, it's not kept in counties. So the average Crow Park, 85,000, which many counties would be in, which people would have a sense of belonging, is split all, all over the place every couple of years, and it's very hard for people to have a sense of real particip participation, being able to hold to account officials, representatives, everything across the public services. If you were from a blank slate art to get rid of the constitution and the criteria, would you have 85,000 as the kind of participative area where people had a sense of belonging so strong in Ireland, in a, on a county level, GAA level, you name it, that they could really participate, whether it comes to health, guards, transport, everything. Would you then have maybe a list system to compensate for the parties of 10% or whatever who wouldn't really have equality? Thanks very much. Um, I, I'm, I'm trying not to give the civil service answer to that question, uh, Jerry, because it is difficult. The, the recent um, constituency review um, threw up all of these issues, you know, um, 
people like to vote with their tribe. I mean, there's no doubt about it. And the Constitution says that we should have, there should be one TD for every 20 to 30,000, and that the average number of um, uh, population should be the same throughout the country. So the constituency review became a battle uh, bet between maths and geography. And that's hard for, um, for individuals because, I mean, every talk I give these days starts off with, um, is there anybody here from Wicklow, Wexford, Erlingford, South Donegal, or Mallow Town? Because none of these people know me, but they all hate me because of the recent oh, no, constituency no. review. You know, I, I, because we, there, I mean, there are 6,314 people in Erlingford who are now voting with what they consider to be the enemy in North Tipperary, you know, and, um, I, I, and, and this is difficult. The one thing I would say, the, the positive light at the end of the tunnel um, here Jerry, I think, is that I'll go back to our research function. The um, the the, uh, the electoral commission has decided to do some research on this issue around twenty to thirty thousand and the shape of constituencies and whether we need six seaters or whatever. The difficulty about clumps of eighty-five thousand people—that's a three-seat constituency. And the, um, the, the academics will always tell you that three-seat constituencies are the least representative um, of the Irish people, that we should be focusing on an average of five-seat constituencies. So uh, district magnitude is something to, um, which we certainly need to look at. Um, list system, first past the post, these are issues the, the, which were considered by the Irish people. In a couple of, time, couple of occasions, we've had referendums, and the Irish people have chosen to reject those proposals for a change, Irish people like elections. They, they see it as a blood sport. They like the way we vote um, for people. It's PRS TV, and people like that too. There would want to be some kind of a groundswell or some momentum, Jerry, in order to be able to make a difference here. For the moment, in the short term, certainly, um, PRS TV seems to be what we've got. Three, four, five seat constituencies is what we're constrained with, but let's see what emerges from the Electoral Commission's consideration of those issues. So thank you for the question. It's a brilliant one. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, we have another question, and we're just going to take an online question before we go to this, this gentleman down here. Um, this is a question for Vivian from Deal from TCPID. In your own life, what has been your biggest barrier to being able to vote? Okay, so that's a brilliant question, and it's lovely to hear uh, the students from Trinity Centre for People with Intellectual Disabilities tuning in. Uh, and uh, that's uh, from, for myself, one of the biggest barriers that I faced was actually uh, not being able to vote in private. Uh, and uh, in the last two elections, in the local elections in 2019, uh, I, it was the first time it happened to me, uh, and I voted at the table, in, and I, I kind of let that go. And then for the general election, uh, I actually, in advance of the election, uh, made a contact with my returning officer and said, to ask them to put him in a, a private ballot uh, box in my, um, a private ballot uh, cubicle, I should say, in uh, our electoral uh, site. Um, but unfortunately, it didn't happen, and it, so it ended up again. And so as I, as I was, uh, in that occasion, uh, I was moved out to the hall to vote. Um, the, the thing about that is why that's, for many people it's say, well, okay, well, accommodation was made on the day, uh, that, but, but there's a bigger issue here. Um, it's, it's about a, a discriminatory issue as well. Uh, and it, it's about the fact that uh, disabled people uh, are not being treated equally. Uh, and which is, it, when you're in your own local community, uh, I, and it's so obvious, uh, it can be very, very difficult. And I think that's what we really need to ask ourselves. Uh, we wouldn't treat any other uh, minority group in that way. Uh, and I think in, if we look at it from, try and look at it from a positive perspective, and as Art has noted in terms of collaboration, that I think in, in my situation on that occasion, a, a huge effort was made to collaborate. Uh, uh, the solution was brought forward, but unfortunately it wasn't acted upon. Uh, so we, we need to work on those structures around ensuring that the voice of disabled people is, is really uh, not only brought up, but listened to and then actioned upon. Uh, so there's, a, there's a, a couple of phases to that. So I, I hope that answered the, 
the question of the TCPID students, and I won't be making a very hard exam for them. Uh, so. <laughs> oh, please do, yeah. <laughs> um, thank, thank you very much, Vivian. Um, we have one other person down here who's been waiting to ask a question as well. Yeah, it's more by way of giving information to Art and anybody else who's interested in the, in the room. Um, I'm Pat Clark, I'm with the European Disability Forum, but I also serve on an OSCE panel on political participation, which is within the realm of the Office of Democratic Institutions and Human Rights. And I note that Art has said there's going to be a, a plethora of elections coming up, and they're talking about evaluating them. But I just wanted to inform you that within that Office of Democratic, there is a, a monitoring manual. But very recently, at the last iteration of that particular panel, they added a module on evaluating elections in relation, in relation to persons with disabilities. Uh, so it might be something that might be a useful tool for you guys to have a look at and get that information. There is also a lot of other information within the OSCE ODEAR office uh, on participation of persons with political um, ambitions, etc. So I just want to give you that bit. Thank you, Pat. And can, can I, Eunice, meet your new best friend, you know, so um, uh, you should have de absolutely have a conversation um, around that because the, uh, again, uh, something we're hearing um, all the time now, please don't reinvent the wheel. So many people have done some brilliant work. I mean, let's copy their homework. You know, this is, um, this will make it easier for us. Um, unfortunately, I think there's loads more questions, but we don't have time for them. But what I would like to do is I'm just going to ask quickly Robert a question because you haven't had a chance to come in there, Robert. Um, and I'm going to give you the great job of kind of wrapping up in, in 30 seconds the core message that you'd like to leave people with today. Yeah, I think of, uh, I don't know if my mic is on there. Uh, yeah, of, uh, of just to my response to just some of the things that would, uh, one thing came up there is the idea of rights uh, versus research. Now, research is very important, but human rights um, uh, even are more en encompassing than research. And research doesn't capital, uh, doesn't find what literally are the hardest people to reach, the people who <coughs> need least, who have least supports and, and who are most vulnerable and uh, least resources. They are harder to reach. A blind person will not find it as easy to make a focus group unless they have a lift, for instance, to get to that focus group. So that is, I just have to emphasise the idea that uh, DPROs properly funded can get around this and we can distill this knowledge. It doesn't replace research, but even DPROs have to be really uh, closely consulted in terms of research as well. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, thanks so much to the panel, to everybody for your great questions um, and we hope that you enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you.